15. Well, why don't you lie down? We'll, we'll see what happens. So the first time I ever encountered um, a lurcher was uh, in 1980, and I just left London and moved to New York City. And you can see on that New York Times number one bestseller, everybody was reading it, even though it was trash. It's kind of Jilly Cooper-ish. And I remember absolutely nothing about Princess Daisy except for one scene where the English girl is going to see this photographer in Soho, and obviously she's looking for love, and obviously she finds it. Uh, and, and he opens the door, and he's really good looking and all that. And um, uh, out lurches this dog, this lurcher. And she goes, oh my God, a, new, a lurcher in New York. Who would ever have believed it? Now, this was the days before the internet, so I couldn't look it up. And I'd looked through all my dog books. I'm a dog fanatic. And I had all these books. I memorized every single breed there possibly is. I had no idea what a lurcher was, and I couldn't find out. Um, but I filed it away in my head. Are you upstaging me? <laughs> yep, she's gone. I filed it away in my head thinking, of it as one of those kind of really exotic, fabulous, uh, mad English things that, that uh, was probably incredibly glamorous and someday I might find out about it. Uh, 25 years later, um, I have no idea what the, what the slides are going to be, but let's have a look. Ah, oh, yeah, that's not, we're not quite ready for this yet, but 25 years later, um, I, uh, 2005, I just quit advertising, I'd written my first book, I'd just finished a year of treatment for cancer, and my daughter wasn't sleeping. She was kind of really disturbed by all the stuff, me being so ill um, during the year. And we tried a whole bunch of different kinds of therapies, and we finally took her to a shrink in Primrose Hill, um, who talked to her for 45 minutes. And I sort of thought, well, okay, if we were in New York, then the shrink would say, well, I should see her two times a week um, for maybe the next five years, and we'll work it all through, and we'll talk it over, and it'll cost you a few thousand pounds, but it'll be worth it. But no, 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 we're in England now. And uh, so the shrink said, I've talked to your daughter for 45 minutes. I've got her problem. I don't need to ever see her again. The solution is, send her to private school and get her a dog. <laughs> I found this picture. This is kind of how I imagined it would work out. <laughs> I think that's Blenheim in the background. But, you know, I imagine we'd get her kind of a dog and she'd be all kind of normal in English and, you know, it would all work out absolutely fine. Uh, so we, we set out, you know, looking for kind of the perfect dog, as you do. I didn't want to just get any old dog. I had an Airedale growing up, which was kind of a disaster. Um, my husband had had a Sheltie, who he really loved. But I, I went around and I started asking people, you know, what's the perfect dog? Which, of course, is the complete mistake that, that dog novices make, the idea that there is a perfect dog. Um, and I, when I, one thing I did discover, uh, but only in retrospect, because I didn't realize at the time, if you ask any single person what the perfect dog is, they'll look at their dog and they'll say, well, well, mine. This one is so affectionate, so lovely, it's, so, it's really perfect, it doesn't shed too much, it doesn't really... And, and then you go, but uh, what, what's the worst thing about your dog? And they go, oh, oh, nothing, nothing is bad. Well. It does bite children. <laughs> but, but only when provoked. <laughs> you know, so, so my mother used to say that people only lie about um, two things, their weight and their commute. But I think the third thing that people lie about all the time um, is the fact that their dogs are absolutely perfect. Um, anyway, I talked to a lot of people. I finally, I was, I was working on the screenplay of How I Live Now, and one of the producers I was working with, and everybody kind of goes, well, you know, my dog, my dog. This guy didn't have a dog. He didn't have, as they say, a, a horse in the race, a dog in the race. He said, the best dog in the world is a Bedlington crossed with a whippet. That's all you need to know. And he was so authoritative about it that I thought, I guess he must be right. So I, we now have Google, I looked it up, this, as well as these, it was the sort of picture I found when I looked up what, what, what is a Bedlington cross with a whippet. I don't know about you guys here, I didn't find that dog very attractive. 
I thought it was really weird looking and kind of skeletal and sort of half starved and sort of scruffy and kind of horrible. But, you know, I wasn't going to argue with the best dog in the world. So I went online and I found a, a website called ePups, e p u p z dot com, in case anybody's interested. Um, and I found a litter of Bedlington Cross whippets out in Gloucestershire. So we all piled into the car and we drove for three and a half hours. The whole time we're driving in the car, we're telling my daughter, uh, we're not going to buy a dog. We're going to browse the puppies. <laughs> I've since discovered that, it, forget the whole um, uh, psychopath test that John Ronson did. You want to know if somebody's a psychopath? Find out if they've ever browsed puppies. <laughs> Browsing puppies is not something that normal people do. And indeed, we arrived there, and there was this, like, this lovely litter of puppies. And you know, my daughter, who was the patient, obviously, she was the one who was disturbed and not sleeping and having night terrors and all that, she fell in love with one dog, this one, this little one who came and sat in her lap. And I fell in love with, with this one who, he's now 11, he used to be better looking. Um, <laughs> And, um, and I felt that there might be a little bit of conflict here because, you know, I, I am a bit of a bully. I didn't really want to totally impose my will on my child because it was supposed to be her dog. But anyway, across the room, I heard my husband talking to the guy who was selling the puppies. And I heard the phrase, I'd really like two of them to go together. If you buy one, we'll give you the second one half price. Now, I don't know if he knew I was Jewish. <laughs> but it really was basically a sale. And in fact, all I can be glad of is that he didn't say, and if you take five, <laughs> you know, you can have them for the price of three, because then we would have had five puppies. So we went home with the puppies, these two Bennington Whippets in a box, knowing absolutely nothing about dogs. My daughter was enthralled. She adored the dogs. She absolutely loved them for two whole weeks. <laughs> After that, they completely went out of favor. And the one thing they do know now, the one command they're really good at now, is if you point at the door and say, out, in a really stern voice, they'll do that because that's what she taught them whenever they came into her bedroom. Um, I think she walked them three or four times in the 11 years that we've had them, and that was usually to kind of impress a boy or something. So, so I'm home all day writing. They're pretty much uh, my dogs. Um, what have we got? Right, so about a month or two after we, we got the puppies, we were in a um, secondhand bookshop in, in Suffolk, and, um, and I found this book, um, and I started leafing through it, and I saw a picture of what was actually our dog, and I was so excited, and, and I had to buy the book, and, and actually, Dee Brian Plummer is a, a completely amazing writer. Um, and, um, and I discovered that what we had were not Bedlington Whippets, but lurchers. And for some reason, I don't really think I knew before much about lurchers. But I went back and I remembered that kind of Princess Daisy moment, and suddenly it was all kind of coming clear. Now, I've done a little bit of a study of um, how people present themselves through their dogs. And if you wanted to do a bit of an analysis of that, you could say that although it was a coincidence and somebody told me that I should get Bedlington Whippets, in fact, I have the most English of all dogs, practically. They're, they're, they're hunting dogs, they're poachers' dogs. You know, you say to people in America, you've got a lurcher, they look at you like you're completely mad. And in fact, a friend of ours um, always asks when she calls us from Florida, how are the lungers? Um, for the purposes of, of, of this talk, I thought, well, I, I'm, I'm going to really go back and, and look a little bit at, at the whole idea of lurchers, this idea of the hunting dog. Um, and, um, and, and actually, they're, they're lurchers, aren't they? They've got the little pointy noses and the little curly tails. They've got deep chests because they're, they're hunters, so they've got to have big hearts, which they do have, um, for running. And they're obviously chasing um, uh, woolly mammoths something, I don't know, uh, 8,000 years ago, Algeria, I don't know what they had there, but whatever it is, they're chasing it. Um, um, 
I should say, I should say now that in that list of all the perfect qualities, you know, which the guys who were selling us, the, the, the couple who were selling us the dogs said, well, they're, they're friendly, they're warm, they're, they're, um, they're gentle, they're, they, they like to sleep a lot, you don't have to groom them very much. If they run for half an hour a day, then they're fine, they'll sleep for the rest of the day. And then there's a little asterisk at the end of anyone talking to you about a lurcher. And way, way down at the bottom of the page, in tiny, tiny print, there's the line, high prey drive. Okay, if I'd looked at these pictures before I bought the dog, I might have had a, an inkling what that really meant. Um, this was a good thing I found. Um, this is, this is from Tutankhamun's tomb, um, and it's a gold kind of thing. You can see, again, we've got some lurchery type things in there. Pointy nose, curly tail, deep chest, little waist. Um, these are names, and apparently they found, well, first of all, Tut was, King Tut was found with the, the collar of his favorite dog when, when he was buried. Uh, he was buried with the collar, so he obviously cared a lot about dogs. But apparently, uh, 75 dog names have been found in hieroglyphics and translated. And um, the article I was reading said that mostly they're descriptive. Um, these were the ones they, they listed. Blackie, brave one, reliable. North wind, fast. Antelope, and useless. <laughs> There's always one who is slightly useless. Sweetheart. He's a little bit useless. Um, this is a bit of a Greek lurcher. Again, pointy nose, deep chest, kind of a waist. Uh, some Roman lurchery type things. You see what they're doing? They're chasing, they're eating, they're killing things. Um, this is from the Bayeux Tapestry, actually, and they're still chasing, hunting, killing. <laughs> Asterisk. Uh, I love this. This is um, uh, uh, supposedly it's called a uh, um, Durer. It's a Durer, Durer drawing, um, and it's always labelled greyhound. I don't think it is a greyhound. I think he's kind of hairy. But of course, there weren't really such things as greyhounds, um, as uh, John was saying earlier. The actual different species weren't really differentiated. Then you would have a hunting dog, and that was a hunting dog, a bit um, a bit hairy, but you know, pretty much what he used to look like when he was young and fit. Um, and this is lovely, look at that. That's my boy, <laughs> or my girl, at a, younger, at a younger time. Either that or it's a goat. <laughs> I'm not 100% sure. Um, and this, I love this one, I'm just throwing this in, uh, a, a portrait of Sarah Bernhardt. Um, and when I first looked at the picture, um, I thought, oh, that's not a lurcher at all, that's a borzoi. Then, you know, they were very majestic. Again, hunters, but Russian, you know, purebred, fabulous stuff. But look at the face. Look at that expression on its, on its face. It's a bit blurry, isn't it? Um, uh, yeah, sorry. So, well, lurchers are all kind of known to be thieves and a bit sly and all that sort of stuff. So I think that expression says that that, that was Sarah Bernard had a, a lurcher. Now, starting in the in the 1600s, um, the, the the this this is a plan of a medieval manor. Um, uh, the the um, enclosures started to fence off land that people would normally have taken their dog out to and, um, you know, caught a rabbit, a rabbit for the pot, as they always say, or a hare or something like that. There, there got to be less and less land for, you know, basic poor people um, to be able to hunt and hunt their dogs on and also to grow their crops on. Um, and this, of course, you know, by about um, the end of the 18th century, this was the beginning of the um, Industrial Revolution because people couldn't make a living anymore uh, in the countryside, so they had to start moving to the cities. <clears throat> um, that was really the time, the enclosures were really the time when greyhounds and lurchers completely diverged as, as separate types of dogs. Um, you ended up with a, a real poacher's dog. Now, it was illegal for uh, someone who was not of noble birth to, um, to own a greyhound, because why would you own a greyhound? It wasn't a pet, it was in order to catch 
uh, rabbits or hares, and the rabbits and hares now belong to the nobleman. So what did you do? You got your dog knocked up by the nobleman's greyhound. It kind of looked like some, and, and it was crossed with some funny little Jack Russell-y thing, you know, there in the middle. Uh, and it turned out all kind of furry and a bit, you know, kind of unauspicious looking. And um, it always came home with a rabbit for the pot. Um, the nobleman, uh, in contrast, uh, would have a beautiful Arab horse and a beautiful purebred, and they started keeping stud books, not only of horses, but of greyhounds at that time. Uh, and this was a sort of typical picture, painting by Stubbs, of a, a nobleman's wealth, basically. His horse, his servant, his very, very beautiful greyhound. Um, right, the origin of the name, uh, I uh, always <laughs> find interesting. I think this is the most accurate version. <laughs> lurch as in, to run off and leave you in the lurch. Er as in, where the hell is that bloody dog gone? Um, in fact, uh, there's a lot of argument about it. Some say it comes from Romany or from Hungarian, and lurch means thief. Um, anyone who's ever uh, owned a lurcher uh, knows that the, the, the term countersurfing uh, comes usually associated with lurcher. There's probably another little asterisk on the name. Um, <clears throat> There's, uh, there's a name, a uh, word from um, Middle English, uh, Lork, Lorker, I think it was, um, which I think it, the, the name may come from, which means one who lurks. And I don't know, kind of lurking. Um, <clears throat> but nobody really knows. Um, I, I had to have this. Lurchers have excellent recall. They recall perfectly well what you want them to do, but can't really be bothered to do it. Um, and this is one of my favorite photographs of two lurchers sitting carefully at attention to their owner, waiting to be told <laughs> what to do. Yeah, they're there somewhere. Um, now, okay, so, so what do we end up with? 11 years later, we have a dog who my daughter completely ignores. Uh, he, he's a majestic fellow. Um, I love this portrait of him. It, to me, represents everything that, that's noble and kind of windswept, and, you know, he's the hunter. He's the ultimate kind of English country dog, uh, living with completely the wrong owner, really. I'm a nice Jewish girl from the American suburbs. Um, and I, I'm not sure I really knew what I was getting into when I ended up with two lurchers. Obviously, I love them uh, uh, beyond everything. Um, but the prey drive has been a real problem um, in the 11 years we've had them. It started fairly innocently. Uh, when he was four, he caught his first squirrel which I thought was really cute, and I'm not really sentimental about squirrels. So although there was a, like a ring of kind of shrieking hybrid mothers standing around going, oh my God, somebody give it mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Um, I was thinking, fine, kill it. Uh, but what I didn't realize was that once they get the old taste of blood. I don't know, do I not listen to adages? I mean, once they get the taste of blood, then they just really like the taste of blood. And so he graduated from squirrels um, to foxes, I think, first. And um, our back garden in Highbury was kind of a, um, a, a war zone. You know, you'd go out in the morning, there'd be like dead foxes everywhere. And, um, and then, sadly, from foxes, he graduated to cats. Um, we moved. Um, and uh, then when we moved, we actually moved into a place that needed a lot of work, and so we had to move out of London for eight months. And I thought, oh, thank God. Um, we'll be away from the neighbors with cats and all that kind of stuff. Well, the first thing he did was murder the neighbor's cat um, in Suffolk. Um, they were quite nice about it. We didn't have to move again. Um, <laughs> But he then, really, totally, i got to give the guy credit for, for kind of initiative, he then decided to start worrying sheep. 
Um, and I never even heard of lurchers kind of chasing sheep, but you know, it went from squirrels to foxes to cats and then to sheep and he now chases deer. And the one thing I am really, really careful about is that I won't take um, my friend over there, her, her lurcher with us when we walk in Suffolk because if there were three lurchers in a pack and they ever took a deer down, that would be the end of my life because he'd realize he could do it. Um, so he is, he's a beautiful, noble animal, but he has ruined our lives. Um, and I have already decided that my next, uh, I, I've been thinking a lot about my next dog and, and what I'm going to get, you know, because if we're lucky, he won't live forever. Um, and um, I've pretty much decided on this. Uh, because I hear that goldfish don't have high prey drives. Um, and I thought I would end with the, um, uh, I give my mother the last word, because she always gets the last word anyway. And uh, when I sent her the picture of the dogs when they were puppies, and he had just won best in show in a local Suffolk show. I mean, you know, these were like really special dogs. And I explained to her all about poachers' dogs and, you know, traditional English dogs and how important they were. And, you know, that this was this, this kind of whole thing that I was buying into. It wasn't just a dog, it was like a lifestyle thing. And I could see my mother thinking, you know, Jewish girl, suburbs, you've come a really long way. In fact, you've really come much too long away. And her comment, her one-line comment was when I sent her the pictures and the explanation all about lurchers was, they're not very Jewish, are they? <laughs> You can